All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're in Genesis chapter 5, starting at verse 1. It says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in God's likeness. Okay, that's very important. He, singular, created him, man, Adam, in Elohim's likeness. Okay. He created them male and female and blessed them. Because Adam was created first. And then after Yahuwah saw that it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, then he put Adam to sleep and took Adam's rib and made a woman out of it. Okay, but initially it was just a male. It was a man living on the earth and walking around. All right. On the day they, they were created, he named them Adam. So you see how even still, does anybody have anything different for verse two? So even still, the woman and the man are called a singular name. And that Adam means man or mankind in some definitions. You will never ever see this done again. You will never ever see a rib being taken out of a human and a being being created. From this point forward, the way humans are reproduced is a different process, all right? So I show, we, we discussed that a little bit in chapters, uh, I believe it was two and three, where Yahuwah's word, which is inside of him, becomes outside of him, an external manifestation called the image of Yahuwah. And those two distinct beings, even though they're the same being, came out, Yahusha came out of Yahuwah because Yahusha is the word of Yahuwah, okay? So Yahusha and Yahuwah said, let us make man in our image. So the way Adam was going to be created was going to be in the likeness of Yahusha and Yahuwah, okay? And so Adam was created, how? By the dirt of the ground. It didn't say that the word of Yahuwah came out and created Adam. Because then we have Yahusha and Adam now being the same. But we don't see that. We see that Yahuwah took dirt, molded it together, and then blew his breath of life into that. And that's how Adam was created. Okay? So that's not the same as Yahusha from Yahuwah, from inside of Yahuwah. That's different. Then we see Yahuwah take the rib of Adam and create a woman. So it's similar to the father taking his word from inside of him and creating Yahusha. But this is different. This is the bone being taken now. It's not the spirit of Adam. It's not the word of Adam. It's not Adam's mind. It's not Adam's wisdom. Yahusha is the wisdom of Elohim. Yahusha is the wisdom of Yahuwah. Yahusha is the word of Yahuwah. You see what I'm saying? So then we get man and woman now made in the likeness of Yahuwah and Yahusha. But here we're seeing now it break down. So on the day they, they were created, he named them Adam. Okay. Verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and became the father of a son in his own likeness. Look at that. This is the first child. The first child. And what is the language being used here? Adam lived 130 years and became the father of a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. All right, hold on. Milo saying she's mumbling something under her breath. What do you say? Seth. Here, are you in chapter five, verse three? And what is your? You have a sephir. What does the sephir say? Nice and loud. Come on. Adam was one hundred three years. He got son after his own image. He named him Seth. Seth is not the first one. Cain and Abel. Yeah, this is continuing from Genesis 4. Yeah, so you're getting tripped up over the, the genealogy? 
He's the order? He's the first son of Saint Cain and Abel. Were already oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I misspoke. All right, thank you. That's all you had to say. I misspoke. I said <laughs> Seth was the firstborn. That's not true. Uh, Cain and Abel were first, and then after. Uh, that's all you had to say. She's like mumbling under her breath. I'm like, what are you trying to say, woman? Speak. Uh, yeah, I misspoke. Seth is not the firstborn. Uh, we just read last week, chapter four, Cain and Abel were born first. Cain murdered his brother Abel. And then at the end of chapter four, right? Yeah, a son was also born to... Uh, that's right. 25. Adam knew his wife again. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, for God has given me another child instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So there it is. All right. So my bad, I misspoke. I got a little, I got a little excited there for a moment with the whole Yahoo Yahusha thing. Okay. It's not the first word. However, this is the first time we're seeing this language. I think that's what you mean. Yeah, that's what I meant. This is the first time we're seeing the language of um, Adam lived 130 years and became the father of a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Okay. Again, some people will use this and say, oh, you see, just like Seth was made in the likeness of Adam. So likewise, Seth isn't Adam. You wouldn't say that Seth is Adam or Adam became Seth, right? So then why would you say Yahuwah became Yahusha? They'll try to play tricks like that. But again, what is the difference of procreation here? What is the process of procreation here? What is the distinction between Yahusha and Seth? Were they both created the same? Was the process the same? Did Yahuwah have to lay with a woman to create Yahusha? No. Yahusha is the word of Yahuwah. Seth isn't the word of Adam. Okay, this is how you debunk these people that try to, what I say, humanize the oneness between Yahuwah and Yahusha. They try to humanize in any way that they can. They see, it, they see something in the scripture and they say, oh, you see, this human experience is exactly the same as the Yahuwah and Yahusha relationship. Don't let them do that. You got you to gotta identify the distinction. Seth was procreated by Adam and Eve, Adam and Hua, okay? They came together and created the seed of Adam and the egg or the, uh, yeah, the egg of, of Eve, okay, created this new baby, all right? That's not the same as the word of Yahuwah. <clears throat> so he was made in the likeness or after his image Seth was not the image of Adam. That's another distinction. Yahusha is the image of Yahuwah. And humans are made in the, in the image of Yahuwah and Yahusha. They're not the image of Yahuwah and Yahusha. Does that make sense? In other words, uh, another passage you could bring up in the, in the Tanakh, is in the uh, Brit Hadashah, in the New Testament, is that we, have all, we all have to be conformed to the image of Messiah. We have to be conformed to the image of Messiah, right? The Messiah is the image of the invisible Elohim. So humans are not the image of the invisible Elohim. We are made in the likeness of the image of the invisible Elohim. Who is the image of the invisible Elohim? Yahusha is. Nobody else replaces him with that title or with that position or that status. Angels are not the image of, of the invisible Elohim. Cherubim, seraphim, none of them are the image of the invisible Elohim. I'm sorry to be spending a lot of time on this. I can't help myself, but I'm gonna move on. Yeah, I'm not sorry, but let me move on because we're going to try to be short today so we can get to Matthew and Acts. All right, verse 4. The days of Adam, <clears throat> the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years and became the father of other sons and daughters. If anybody's reading the Septuagint, double check me to see if these dates are right because sometimes numbers and years and stuff with the Septuagint versus the Masoretic text are different. And I will, I will lean more on Septuagint when it comes to uh, years. That could be on a separate video, but. Uh, five, 
All the days, verse five, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, then he died. That's a lot of years, all right? Almost a thousand. Verse six, Seth lived 105 years, then became the father of Enosh. I have a cross reference here. Genesis 4.26, it says, A son was also born to Seth, and he named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of Yahuwah. Go ahead, d what you got? Uh, Brenton Septuagint says, Now Seth lived 205 years and begot Enosh. Look at that. Already. I told you. I told you. So for those who don't, I do this every video, but for those who are watching this for the first time, the Septuagint manuscript is the Greek Old Testament that predates Messiah's birth on the earth. It's BC. It's around uh, 200 to 300 BC. So it's about almost, almost 300 years before the Messiah was even born on the earth as a human. Okay? So the Septuagint is very ancient. Now, most and scriptures, most scriptures uh, use the Masoretic text for the Old Testament which the Masoretic text was penned. It was a copy of a copy. It was put together uh, in the 900s AD. So it's 900 years after the Messiah is born. So there are, there are dis just some discrepancies. Between the Masoretic I was going to say, go ahead, d Septuagint, Septuagint is, uh, was a Greek way of saying 70, or the 70 scribes, and half of them were Hebrew, half of them were Greek. That, Wrote the Septuagint. Yep, yep. Um, I heard that there were 70 Hebrew and 70 Greek. It could have been, I could have that wrong too. I'm not sure. Yeah. But yeah. And what they did was the Greek emperor, he wanted to leave a legacy for himself before he died. So instead of building a statue or, or a temple, somebody, one of his counselors encouraged him, you want to be remembered after you die for, for, for eternity, forever? Go chase down those Hebrews and force them to make an Old Testament, to make, uh, force their scriptures to be interpreted in our language. And he was like, I like that idea. So he that was wrote, Alexander the Great, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was Alexander, yep. And uh, so he wrote them and said, look, I'll give you guys water, food, I'll give you all this stuff if you would just come with 70 of your men and translate it. And the Israelites were like, no, we're not, we're not letting heathens touch our scriptures, you know? And uh, so he, he tried a second time. And then the third time, he's like, all right, listen, if you don't send it, we'll destroy you. <laughs> so we're going to kill you. So basically, it was done by force. And they put these 70 Hebrews in different rooms. They put them all in different rooms. This is a story I've heard about it. And if it's a lie, I apologize. But this is what I've read. And this is also what I've heard from an actual Greek Orthodox Christian, somebody who uses the Greek Septuagint and speaks Greek and was born in Greece and is an Orthodox Christian. And you can't get any more Christian than Orthodox because Orthodox is like the roots. It is like first century type of religion, okay? That if you're gonna be a Christian, that's the kind of Christian you should be if you're gonna be a Christian, okay? So he, this guy, he was my neighbor where I used to live and he gave me the whole breakdown of how the Septuagint was put together. And, um, <clears throat> So they put them in different rooms for accuracy. They, they went into each different room and they asked these different men to translate the same scriptures and then they would go to each room to see if they were all translating it from Greek, from Hebrew to Greek the same way. So it was a very... That's how you get a good, like, the right story too, you know, like, just when people like, detectives do that to people and all that. Yep. So the only thing I don't like about Septuagint is they hid the father's name, obviously because the, the, the Hebrews at that time were already doing it in their language. They were calling Yahuwah Adonai, um, and they were calling him Lord instead of his name. So they translated that into, uh, into the Greek. So when you look at the Greek Septuagint, you're not going to find the Tetragrammaton. You're not going to find the four letters of the Father's name. You're not going to find that. You're going to see the word Kyrios, which is Lord. Uh, that's the only thing I don't like about the Septuagint. Um, other than that, there is discrepancies between the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Masoretic text with the vowel points and the Septuagint. And this is one of them. It's ages, dates, and times. It's very weird. There's a whole conspiracy on YouTube. I'm not going to get into it. 
there's conspiracies about why they did that because they're trying to hide who the real people are, things like that. So I'll, 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 I'll give you some points on that. Those people, those conspiracy theories, okay? There is some legitimate issues with these ages and numbers. Um, I digress. That's it. So thank you, D-Rail. You can keep interrupting me and let me know if there's different numbers here. So Seth was... Um, I found another one. You said 200, right? 200. Yeah. Verse 4 it said it was uh, 700 years or 800? It said 800 years. Uh, all right, and it's up to it's 700. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a big difference between 800 and 700, for goodness sake. So some people will look at this and say, oh, you see, this is why you can't trust the scriptures. You got to give yourself to the Quran. There's no corruption in the Quran. Baloney, don't listen to these people, okay? Um, the reason why the Quran isn't... Uh, don't you don't have these discrepancies with, with the Quran is because they hit it. There's only one person. There's like there's only like one people that can actually have access to the scriptures versus Yahuwah allowed these scriptures to be accessed at this point globally. You know, so by default, there's going to be an issue there with people getting their hands on the scriptures. But that's why it's our job to do our homework. It's our job to do our homework and be detectives. Yahuwah ain't. Yeah, who is not expecting us to be lazy and sit on the couch and just swallow everything, you know? We got to do our due, due diligence. So search the scriptures as if it's gold, okay? Treasures of gold. That means you got to do some work, all right? So <clears throat> verse 7, Seth lived after he became the father of Enosh 807 years and became the father of other sons and daughters. Wrong? Dang, that's horrible. I could get it. I'll get it, D-Rail. I got it right here. I got it. I got it. I got the, I got the Septuagint on my phone app, too. Seth lived after he, he begat Enosh 707 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. <laughs> now we're on the same page. And Enos lived a hundred and ninety years and begot Canaan. And Enos lived, or Enosh, lived after his begetting Canaan seven hundred and fifteen years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enosh were nine hundred and five years, and he died. Canaan lived a hundred and seventy years, and he begot Maleliel, Maleliel. And Canaan lived after his begetting Maleliel 740 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And Maleliel lived 165 years, and he begot Yared. I know, Stephanie's shaking her head. She's seen all the differences in numbers. It's incredible, isn't it? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. For goodness sake. Genealogies here, which is, a, which is very important to timing and to knowing how long people were around and when messages were being passed on to who. You're throwing off things by hundreds of years. That's not cool at all. That's not cool. My scripture, my scripture says, Mahalaya was 65 years and brought forth your head. So that, that's a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Masoretic. Masoretic says 65. The Masoretic text. I, just based on what I've learned and what I've, I've heard about this issue, I think the Septuagint is more accurate. There's, there's, a, there's, there's one that really got me. One that really got me was the, uh, the video that I think I shared with you guys off off record the video on um how long the israelites were in captivity or in bondage that timing they weren't in egypt for 400 years that's a lie it doesn't make sense it doesn't add up it's impossible that they were there that long but from the time of abraham when he was given the covenant to the time where moses uh was given the law that's 400 years and it's and it's and it's uh, confirmed in the book of Galatians. 
because it says from the time of Abraham to Moses was 400 years. So this idea that the Israelites were in Egypt in bondage for 400 years, it's not accurate. Anyway, that's the one that sold me. I was like, whoa. And there was a whole presentation on it. Well done. Uh, anyway, let's keep going. These are genealogies. So I'm, I'm going to use the Septuagint uh, until, you know, we get away from this genealogy stuff. It says, and Mal Maleliel lived after his begetting Yared 730 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Malaliel were 890 and five years, and he died. And Yared lived a hundred and sixty and two years and begot Enoch. And Yared lived after his begetting Enoch eight hundred years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Yared were nine hundred and sixty and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived a hundred and sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch was well pleasing to Elohim after his begetting Methuselah two hundred years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty and five years, and Enoch was well pleasing to Elohim and was not found because Elohim translated him. That's what the Septuagint says. Masoretic would say, took him. All right. I, I have some discrepancy. Go you ahead. Said he was, you said he was pleased with him, but I have that uh, he walked with him 300 years. I don't, I don't have a problem with that because um, if, you, if you walk as Yahushua walked, or if you, um, I would look at that as being in covenant with, so I would see it as the same thing. When you walk with somebody, right? Like, uh, for example, uh, I don't know. Something's coming off the top of my head right now. Psalms chapter one. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor, nor sits in the seat of the scornful or stand in the path of sinners. Something like that. Walk, right? So walking would be a language of, for me, it would be a language of covenant. You know, like. We walk together. We're in fellowship with one another. We walk together. We don't walk with unbelievers. We're not equally yoked with them. We have a different walk. We have a different path. So I don't see too much of a problem between those, that discrepancy or that distinction. But thank you for pointing it out. I do this with D-Rail a lot. D-Rail does this. If you guys pay attention, like I'll tell D-Rail, D-Rail, if you're reading this at Trujan, let me know if you see something different. And he'll point out every single difference, but sometimes the difference isn't really that bad. It's not really that, that big of a deal. This one's one of them that I don't think is a big deal. It's saying the same message. Enoch was definitely walking well and in good standing with Yahuwah. Yeah, you'll see it also in chapter six with Noah. It says the same thing. Boy, you better chapter stop reading ahead, boy. You better stay focused. Stay focused. We on <laughs> chapter five right now. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> that boy read that. That's funny. I was just gonna say uh, something else. I noticed with chapter five is how there are um, there are only few that are named. I don't know if there's any distinction or significance with that, but it does talk about how everyone is bringing forth sons and daughters as if it's more, but he's only naming certain ones. As far as scriptures, he's only naming certain ones. So I thought that was. Um, interesting and what comes to mind is many are called and few are chosen I don't know if you know there's any significance in that very good catch Ezzy. I, I think there is significance to that um, I was actually given something by brother Doug I'm gonna advertise him a little bit real quick brother Doug sent me an email or a text was it an email or it was probably a text I will, if anybody wants this information I'm about to share, just email me or comment. No, email me because this video, Facebook video will be deleted. Uh, but YouTube video on YouTube, if you want what I'm about to say, email me and I'll forward you the link. But uh, Brother Doug had emailed me a link to a Christian 
uh, a Christian that put together all the names of these genealogies, and it actually, it actually is the gospel being preached. The names. Are yeah. Names. Yeah. Wow, like the meaning of their names or something. Yes. If you put all the names in order, boom, boom, boom. It is awesome. Like I got goosebumps. I was like, Doug, send me that. Cause I told him, I was like, read it. I was like, just read, read some, some of it for me. Just, just, just start reading. And he was like, I was like, yeah, send me that. Send me that. That's going to go into my oneness, uh, my oneness library right there. So I'll, uh, after this, after this is over, I'll probably look for it and we can, uh, check it out. But yeah, it's beautiful, 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 beautiful. So yeah, Ezzy, for sure. I think that's a, that's actually a good point that I didn't even realize. Like, there's other children, but only specific ones are being named. That's not accidental. That is not accidental. So good catch. For sure. <clears throat> yep. All right, where were we? 25? Verse 25? Yep. So Enoch got translated. He got taken up. So Enoch never died. So he's not the first to be resurrected from the dead and ascend into heaven. Yahusha is, okay? Enoch went straight up without dying. There is a difference. Just want to let you know. In case anybody tries to make fun of, you know, or, or scoff Yahusha in the New Testament, okay? Enoch and Yahusha situation, different, All right? We don't know where he got taken up to, by the way. It just says he was taken up or he was translated. We don't know where he was translated to. <laughs> oh, gosh. What is that, the book of Enoch? What is that, yeah? So, interesting. Let's see if there's, let, let me see if there's a cross-reference. Let's, let's read some cross-references on this. Um, on verse 24 about Enoch. I have two that pop up. Um, that one doesn't seem to fit to me. I'm going to go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, chapter 5. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he wouldn't see death and he was not found because Elohim, God, translated him. Look at that. They use translated, which is what the Septuagint said directly, right? The Masoretic says, took him. But look, it's funny because this verse has both. It says, Enoch was taken away. So that would fit with the Masoretic version. And then it says, and he was not found because Elohim translated him. That would fit with the Septuagint version. So we got both being fit into one verse. And then it says, for he has had testimony given to him that before his translation, he had been well-pleasing to Elohim. So there's the well-pleasing, which comes from the Septuagint versus the walking with. But again, it's the same. I don't think it's the issue. So, and then without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing to him. For he who comes to Elohim must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Hallelujah. So there's a cross-reference. That was fun. Let's go to Genesis 5, verse 25 down. Continue. <clears throat> Methuselah. Now, let me go back to the Septuagint. And Methuselah lived a hundred and sixty and seven years and begot Lamech. And Methuselah lived after his begetting Lamech eight hundred and two years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah which he lived were nine hundred and sixty and nine years and he died. And Lamech lived an hundred and eighty and eight years and begot a son. And he called his name, what is this? Noah? I got Noe. Oh, it's Noach. It's different. It's not Noah. Yeah. Noach in Hebrew. All right, so this is uh, Noah. And saying, this one will cause us to cease from our works and from the toils of our hands and from the earth, which Yahuwah Elohim has cursed. Is that Yahuwah there? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I don't like about the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. They don't honor 
the father's name. Thank you. So I just took a guess there. Interesting. Check this out. Check this verse out. This is saying uh, that Noah will cause us to cease from our works and from our toils, right? From what I understand, after the flood and after the waters receded, they went back into working and tilling the land again. Everything remained exactly the same. Nothing changed. So why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because Old Testament only Israelites that don't believe in the New Testament say, yeah, who should say he's going to come and take away the curse? And he's supposed to be the Messiah. And he's supposed to redeem us all from captivity and bondage. And he resurrected. And where's, what's the, we're still in bondage. He wasn't no king. Maybe you're not fully understanding what the message was about. Just like, if you're going to mock Yahusha, then mock this passage as well in your own scripture, your own Old Testament. Where is the, where is the ceasing from toils and ceasing from works and the toils of our hands and all that? And the curse. Where, where is Noah delivering them from the curse of the land that Yahuwah cursed? Okay. What is the answer? All I can say is Noah, Noah and his three sons were saved from the wrath of Yahuwah. They were blessed to be able to live and have favor with Yahuwah. Okay? In relationship with Yahuwah. In covenant with Yahuwah. They were allowed to be in covenant with the God of Noah, which was Yahuwah. That is the privilege and the honor. You want to know how you're set free? There's two ways you could be set free from the curses and the toils of this land. One is by being in covenant with Yahuwah, even though you're still struggling and toiling from the land and still in this earth and still struggling. You're in relationship, so your struggles are not to be compared with your relationship with Yahuwah. That's one way. The second way is the full manifestation where officially, yes, those things will be done away with and destroyed. The curse will be reversed. Everything else will be, you know, um, the right, the wrong will be made right. The path, the crooked path, will be made straight. All that new heavens and new earth. So there's two different manifestations to this kind of language. My wife is saying, could it be possible that a third option could be that because they all died, so they all ceased from the works because they died? <laughs> I guess. I guess you could fit that in there. But what about Noah then? Well, he continued, yeah. So I guess that thought. I it have a pressure. Uh, who was that? That was Ezzy. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Ezzy. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Um, Isaiah 54, um, starting in verse 8, it says, In an overflow of wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I shall have compassion on you, said Yahuwah, your Redeemer. For this is the waters of Noah to me and that I have sworn that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth so have I sworn not to be wroth with you nor to rebuke you for though the mountains be removed and the hills be shaken my kindness is not removed from you nor is my covenant of peace shaken said Yahuwah who has compassion on you so I mean for me could it be that there's comfort in Noah's righteousness is that is that the comfort you know, that we're able to work and toil and go through life without worrying about being smitten by the flood. <laughs> but there's still judgment, you know, in the end. Yeah, no, I think this was a good passage here. Um, I think it has to do with relationship. Because the wrath of God abides on all unbelievers, right? Hallelujah. Those who don't believe are condemned already. And the wrath of God abides upon them, right? and to follow them to the day of judgment if they don't believe. But those who believe, we don't have to worry about the wrath of Yahuwah. If we're obeying and we're being faithful and walking with him, abiding in him, drawing near to him, we don't got to worry about that. So I think, yeah, you're bringing out the point that I was bringing. I think this passage points to, to that. It's, a, it's about relationship and covenant. In the midst of your still... You're still, you're still working by the sweat of your brow. We're still working hard. Nothing's changed there. 
Wives are still struggling when they give birth. It hurts. It's painful. <laughs> Ain't nothing changed. But our relationship, those who are obedient and righteous, we serve the God of Noah, the one who was saved from the flood and his three sons. Now, we saw that generations later, there were some who decided not to follow the God anymore. So it's their choice. But yes, we still got judgment coming, as he, exactly. There is still judgment coming. Might not be with water flooding the earth, but it's going to be something else. All right. Genesis chapter 5, verse 30. And Lamech lived after his begetting Noah 560 and five years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 753 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and he begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafeth. I was going to detail most of them end at the same tour, some of their age, for most, most of them, Chris and Adam. All right. Milo's saying that even though some of the dates were different, some of the ages were different, the totals were usually the same. All right. All right, let's... Uh, Let's stop there. That was Genesis chapter 5. Anybody got any comments or questions? Members, disciples, any comments? Guess. Comment. Questions. Well, I would say from verse 5 when Adam died, that was the fulfillment of, well, what to say prophecy would be the right word, but when you would have said, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die because he didn't die as soon as he ate it. Mm -hmm. But that this would be this will be your end. You will wind up dying. So I was like, that's the first fulfillment of that punishment. Okay. First fulfillment of punishment. Uh, that you would die if you eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil was fulfilled in verse five, my wife is saying. Sounds good to me. That well, leads me to a question. Go ahead. I don't see Hawa dying. So... <laughs> because, you know, they were named Adam in the beginning. Is this the two of them? Or where is Hawa? Hawa is still alive today. She's in a cave somewhere. She's in the Quran caves, protected by the government. They don't want us to get to her. <laughs> nah, I'm just joking. I, I don't know. Um, she got that's a good point. Yeah, she definitely, she definitely had to have died, but it's true that she wasn't mentioned. Um, were any women mentioned here dying? It's all men, right? Yeah, I think. That, yeah, it's all men. Yeah, I think that's one of the things of these scriptures, and right, especially now the genealogies is male, male focused, dominated. I guess however you want to say. But there's somebody out there that has a conspiracy that. That Hava is uh, still alive somewhere. Somebody out there already created a video about it. Guaranteed. If not, they're going to take what I just said and make a video conspiracy about it right now. Be careful, y'all. Be careful with these folk on YouTube. Uh, anybody else got a question or a comment? Going once, going twice. All right, now it's Genesis chapter 5. Shalom.